This is Transparency, a podcast by Gender Dysphoria Alliance, hosted by Aaron Kimberly and Aaron Terrell. Each week we'll be joined by people who have personal or professional experience with gender dysphoria and physical transition. We'll also discuss how our trans experiences relate to the concept of gender identity. Join us for a compassionate yet heterodox approach to the question of trans. Welcome back to Transparency, everyone. Um, I've been excited to have this conversation. Um, unfortunately, my co-host Aaron Terrell is out of town this week, so he couldn't join us. Um, but I um, would like to introduce Dr. Kenneth Zucker, um, who many of you will already be familiar with, but he is a Canadian psychologist. He's been working in the field of um, you know, gender medicine or um, you know, the treatment of gender dysphoria since 1975. Um, he's a, both a clinician and a researcher um, and chair. He was chair of the DSM working group on gender identity disorders. Um, so welcome um, to the show, Dr. Zucker. Thank you for asking me to participate. Um, you know, we've uh, at Gender Dysphoria Alliance, we've been engaged in the this conversation now for about almost, a, I think a little bit over a year. Um, and a lot has changed in this past year. Um, of course, you know, the, what's been on my mind recently is the um, announcement that the Tavistock Gender Identity Service will be shutting down and they're redesigning their services there. And I thought that would be a perfect time to um, have a conversation with you about the clinic that you ran in Toronto um, because it's my understanding that the closure of the Tavistock Clinic is, is closing for almost the exact opposite reason why, why yours was closed. And so I'd like to get, if you could just tell us a little bit about the, the clinic when it was running. Sure. Um, so it was originally called the Child and Adolescent Gender Identity Clinic, and it was established in 1975 at the Clark Institute of Psychiatry in Toronto by a child psychiatrist named Sue Bradley, who I worked with for many decades. Um, she retired uh, a couple of years before our clinic was shut down in December 2015. The origins of the clinic uh, were more or less serendipitous, not particularly planned out. Um, and the way it started was that around 1969, uh, the Ontario provincial health system asked the Clark Institute to start evaluating adults for what was called back then sex reassignment surgery. So an adult clinic was started by a psychiatrist named Betty Steiner um, and it got rolling. And then <clears throat> by the mid 1970s, Steiner started to get a few referrals of children and adolescents. Um, she was an adult psychiatrist, so not really qualified to see younger people. So she made a call down to the child program to ask, would anybody like to start seeing these kids? Back then, the psychiatrists had different teams and Sue Bradley had one team and she said, sure, why not? She's always had a variety of interests. And so that's how the clinic got going. Um, so there was Bradley and we would have psychiatry residents coming through the clinic. There was a social worker and there were a bunch of us graduate students in psychology uh, in the child program who worked with her. <clears throat> Now, how did I wind up working with her? I moved to Toronto from the States in 1975 to do my PhD in developmental psychology. And 
I had read Richard Green's 1974 book called Sexual Identity Conflict in Children and Adults. And in addition to being in developmental psychology, I already had a master's degree in clinical. So I, I wanted to do clinical work as well. And I serendipitously also noted that Bradley was doing a child psychiatry rounds, talking about Richard Green's book. Nobody really knew very much about what was called transsexualism back then. And I met Dr. Bradley and joined her team. And in the beginning, uh, we always wanted there to be a research component to it. So almost from the beginning, uh, we developed a standardized assessment protocol um, that would complement the clinical assessments. And that's how things got rolling. Um, in the early years, um, we saw way more children than we saw adolescents. And so the focus of almost all of my research for several decades was primarily on children. Why, um, why do you think that was? that you were seeing mostly children and not adolescents? Well, that's a great question. Um, and it's sort of related to changes that we've seen over the past 15 or 20 years where there's been a huge increase in the number of children and adolescents being referred to specialty clinics or to clinicians in private practice who specialize in this area. Um, now, when it comes to children, of course, for virtually just about anything, uh, it's parents or say a family doctor or a teacher who might suggest going to see a clinician and I remember many years ago, we did a qualitative study uh, trying to code for, you know, why did parents contact the clinic? Um, what were their worries and concerns? Um, so one worry was that their kid might want to grow up and change their gender. Uh, and these, by the way, aren't mutually exclusive. Other parents associated, I'll call it gender dysphoria now, but gender dysphoria or extreme gender nonconformity with their kid growing up to be gay. Mm -hmm. And there were some parents who didn't want that to happen. So very early in the clinic, we uh, made it clear that we didn't have a goal of wanting to change a child's eventual sexual orientation, um, even if somebody knew how you could do that. But from a psychoeducational point of view, we always made that clear when it was necessary. Mm -hmm. um, and even nowadays, you know, some families I see parents still have that worry. It's quite variable. Um, another reason people would contact the clinic is their child started to be teased for engaging in gender variant behavior, or talking about wanting to be the other gender. And so, um, although we did see a pretty large number of kids younger than age five, uh, social ostracism 
social ostracism increases with age. So of all the, let's say 650 kids we saw over the years between the age of two and 12, their mean age was around seven. Um, another reason parents might uh, contact the clinic is they would say their kid seems very unhappy being who they are and the kid was distressed. And a lot of the kids, especially as they got older, had other mental health challenges, which were also a cause for concern. And then sometimes parents would say, we think there's stuff going on in our family that's contributing to this. So there are a whole host of reasons. Now, why we saw very few adolescents uh, in the early days um, is an interesting question. And oh, I'm not sure that I have a good explanation for it, but, um, and we can come back to that when we talk about how therapeutic models have evolved over the years, but we started to see a shift in the number of adolescents coming to the clinic in the mid 2000s and i even wrote uh, a letter to the editor i think in 2008 called is gender identity disorder in adolescence coming out of the closet to try to come up with some explanations as to why more kids were coming out and i think there are multiple influences. The internet gives people more access to information, um, social media, of course, uh, the availability of hormonal suppression, which we started to use in some of our adolescents as early as 1999. We were actually, I think, the first clinic in North America to systematically uh, consider hormonal blockers following what the Dutch were doing. Mm -hmm. Then another explanation I think is that there's been less stigma associated with gender dysphoria and having a trans identity. And so maybe it was easier to come out um, for adolescents. So that's sort of the origins question mm -hmm. of the clinic. Yeah, the, the adolescents coming out, um, I wouldn't think that that, I wouldn't think it would be very typical though for that adolescent to have demonstrated absolutely no gender atypical behavior as children. I mean, if, if they had, if they were gender nonconforming as children and then came out as an adolescence, that's one thing, but to have no evidence at all of any gender atypical behavior and then come out as an adolescent and start to have gender atypical behavior, I wouldn't think that that would be a very common presentation. So back in the day, um, and we published a paper on this in uh, 2012, took a long time to write it up. I would say the following, that among the birth assigned females that we saw for the first time in adolescence, I would say the vast, vast majority of them had a hist childhood history of gender dysphoria or uh, gender nonconformity. But for whatever reason, they weren't referred clinically to our clinic until the adolescent years. Um, and as we talk about where things are currently, that's no longer the case. Mm -hmm. Among adolescent birth assigned males, though, from the very beginning, we had two subgroups. One were males who also had an early history of gender dysphoria or uh, extreme gender variant behavior, which intensified to the point of kids wanting to 
uh, socially change their gender and get biomedical treatment. But from the very beginning, we also saw a subgroup of adolescent males who had co-occurring what was called transvestic fetishism back in the day. Um, now in the DSM-5, it's called uh, transvestic disorder. So these were adolescent males who also had uh, co-occurring sexual arousal associated with cross-dressing, in quotes. Um, and as you know, we became more familiar with the concept of autogynephilia um, that Blanchard started to write about in the 1980s, uh, late 1980s, uh, a good percentage of these adolescent males would acknowledge uh, that they would be sexually aroused at the thought of being a girl or a woman or sexually aroused at the thought of having uh, female genitalia or breasts, etc. cetera. Um, so they are a distinct subgroup, I think, from the kinds of kids that people typically think about and I remember um, years ago, I talked with some of my Dutch colleagues, um, and at least back then, they never saw adolescent males from this second subgroup. They certainly saw them as adults in the gender identity clinic in Amsterdam, but very rarely saw this second subgroup of kids, which is interesting in terms of, you know, why might that be the case? Mm -hmm. uh, Were there many clinics at that time? It, it, was it primarily the Amsterdam clinic and, and your clinic? Um, well, when we started our clinic in 1975, um, Richard Green, sort of had a little clinic at UCLA and there was another group at UCLA who was seeing these kids. Um, John Money at Johns Hopkins would see the occasional kid. Um, in fact, he and Richard Green first wrote about these kids in 1960. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, these were very small programs. And I think ours really was the first clinic that really got established and kept going. The Dutch Clinic for Children and Adolescents was started by Peggy Cohen Ketnis in the late 1980s. And then at some point along the way, she moved uh, to the Free University in Amsterdam. And that clinic, of course, now is one of the major clinics uh, internationally. But as you know, there are now dozens upon dozens of clinics for children and adolescents all over North America, Western Europe, Scandinavia, Australia, pretty much everywhere. Yeah. In terms of the treatment model, um, I mean, you said earlier you were, uh, you're a developmental psychologist. What is your understanding of the, so of the two cohorts, the, the childhood onset gender dysphoria, what, what is your understanding from a developmental psychology perspective? Well, um, you know, I think whatever models we had over the years, um, I'm sure that they've changed. Um, and, but if I use, you know, 2022 
and go back in time and think about what were we thinking about um you know i can come up with a narrative but i would say that conceptually the way i've thought about it for a long time is definitely a developmental one that how i might conceptualize what the therapeutic approach could be with a three-year-old is going to be different from an approach with a 13-year-old and that's going to be different from the approach with a 23-year-old and i think back in the early days for example um our perspective when we saw somebody for the first time in adolescence that their gender identity was pretty consolidated um and one could say you know even if let's say the adolescent wanted their gender dysphoria to go away without say transitioning or getting biomedical treatment there wasn't a lot in the literature at that time that suggested that that was very likely and in that respect i think back then we may have seen these adolescents as more similar to adults where um gender identity is back then was also seen as pretty consolidated um and i always always remember a quote from a paper in 1961 in a journal called acta psychiatrica scandinavica scandinavica where a psychiatrist was writing with regard to adult transsexualism he used a different term but he said it it defies psychiatric treatment and so back then you know that was part of the context for uh hormones and surgery if that really is going to be along with living as the desired gender the only way to reduce the gender dysphoria and you know, when I think about it from the vantage point of 2022, I always will say to parents or kids that, you know, the goal is to reduce your gender dysphoria. <clears throat> and we just have to figure out what's the best way to do that. With regard to children, um, you know, my, I think, bias back then was that gender identity formation is a process and I wasn't convinced that a three-year-old necessarily was going to persist in their desire to be the other gender and I think even by the late 1970s, 1980s, there were some small scale follow up studies of children. Um, most of them would have actually been seen, you know, prior to any formal diagnostic criteria, but their reasons for presenting were consistent with what was the what were the criteria for gender identity disorder of childhood in the DSM-3 in 1980, moving up to the DSM-5 in 2013. And, you know, Richard Green's 1987 book um, he reported that you know, of 44 feminine boys that he had in his research study, only one seemed to have persisted with the desire to be of the other gender at the age of 18. So even in the early days, um, 
there were data suggesting that persistence may not be what is going to happen. And as we go along talking, I'll, I wanna say more about that, but, um, and also thinking about ways in which the developmental model of gender identity formation, I think needs to be rethought in light of some of the new developments that are going on in the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I imagine I, I, I myself would have been a fairly typical kid um, that you would have seen at the clinic. My gender dysphoria, I remember it as, as far back as about age three and my parents would have would confirm that. Um, I was never taken to any kind of clinic though um, until I was well into um, my adulthood. So I imagine there are a fair number of people out there even when your clinic was open that, you know, these kids were running around, not necessarily being brought to your clinic. Was your clinic provincial or was it pretty much just, just local patients that you saw? Um, we could see anybody in the province of Ontario, but probably the vast majority were children in Toronto and the surrounding region, but anybody in Ontario could come and, because it was in a hospital, you know, being seen was covered by the provincial healthcare system in terms of physician billing. And, you know, if you're a psychologist or a social worker in a hospital, uh, you're just salaried. You're not right. billing people and yeah. things like that. So you would have had, had families traveling long distances. They would have been pretty highly motivated to come and see you then. I would think if they were willing to, to travel from elsewhere in the province. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, your point about probably not the entire population of children with possible gender dysphoria uh, would have been seen for sure. Um, and that gets into, you know, very interesting issue about what is the representativeness of clinic referred samples because not all children are going to be seen but uh what one can do is do comparisons across clinics and some of the research i've done over the years uh, did involve uh, comparative studies of children seen in toronto uh, versus children that were seen in the Netherlands. And there were both similarities and differences. For example, I think in terms of our measures of gender dysphoria or gender variant behavior, they were pretty similar across the two clinics. But there were also differences, for example, the mean age of kids that we saw in Toronto was a little younger than the mean age in the Netherlands. Uh, so for example, it was very rare, uh, at least in the samples that we looked at a while ago, for the Dutch to see children five years of age and younger. Whereas in our clinic, about 22% of all of the children were at that young age. So both similarities and, and differences. What was the approach for working with say like a five-year-old? What would that, what would that typically look like? Well, I think that it would be difficult to say that there was, you know, one specific approach um for various reasons um some families may never have gone into any kind of therapy they just came for an assessment and either they didn't want to be in therapy or they were happy with just making recommendations uh to implement in the day-to-day -day environment um but then in terms of 
you know, the therapeutic approach, we would try to have a formulation as to why a particular kid was feeling the way that they were. And then we might try to organize uh, the therapy around the formulation. So for example, I'll take what might be something maybe on the more mild side of things. So suppose you have a five-year-old birth assigned male who temperamentally was very anxious because a lot of the kids we saw were what we would call internalizers, anxious, very sensitive, sometimes depressed. And some of these birth assigned males really had a hard time making friends with other males their age. They found them too rough or uh, too scary and they didn't like rough and tumble play. And so sometimes in the kid's mind, they would start to think, well, maybe if I was a girl, then this wouldn't be an issue for me because I could just play with girls. Mm -hmm. And so if we thought about wanting to expand their peer group so that they're not just playing with girls, we might suggest to parents, maybe you can nominate or think about other males, your kid's age, who are not too rough and macho, and they might be able to bond over other types of activities so mm -hmm. to try to increase uh, the flexibility so one of the you know, I, I would have called it a risk factor back in the day um, you know as these males got older it was very common for girls to no longer want to play with them because the girls would see the kid you're a boy and we don't want to play with you Right. The concept of gender segregation. Um, and um, as a result, they could become quite isolated and just not have any friends. And uh, so that's like one parameter. Um, then there can also be parameters that are more complex that pertain to family dynamics where parents wrestle with the meaning of gender and uh, sometimes having ambivalence about having a son because of different life experiences parents themselves may have had and that can color the relationship between the parent and child. And then if that was the case, then one would really want to do exploration of the meaning of gender within the family. Some of the more dramatic and intense uh, cases I saw over the years, for example, would be birth assigned females who were exposed to pretty intense uh, aggression on the part of uh, older male, whether abuse of the mother um, or even abuse of the kid. And one mechanism back in the day we thought about was an old psychodynamic concept of identifying with the aggressor that if you identify with the aggressor, somehow you feel safe. And I remember one young kid who told me, you know, if I was a boy, I'd have a penis and I'd be stronger and then I could protect my, my mom. So 
in a case like that, one might be dealing with a trauma history that needs to be worked through. And sometimes we would see young adolescent females with a very recent history of sexual abuse. And some of the kids would be able to say, you know, I know why I want to be a boy, because if I look like a boy and act like a boy, I'll be left alone and I'll feel safer. Um, one of the, you know, very complicated issues is around uh, how does one respond on the part of a parent to think about developmental models of gender development? Um, social learning theory always played a pretty big role in theorizing about gender differences with the idea being that there's reinforcement for certain types of gender related behaviors and either discouragement or you know, non responding to other types of gender behavior. And in Richard Green's book in 1974, when he was ruminating about etiology, he felt that the most common factor he was seeing was that when a child first started to display gender variant behavior, it was reinforced. Now, over the years in developmental and gender developmental psychology, I think the models have become more complicated and people talk about how children themselves actively construct their own gender and things become internalized <clears throat> and one of the interesting direction of effects issue that i'm not sure has been resolved to this day is what comes first you know does a child first start to recognize that the world consists of largely two gender classes and you say between the age of two and three put yourself in one of those classes and then you start to search for well how does that class of kids behave and so you start to adopt gender behaviors that other people in the same class engage in so the direction of effect there would be gender identity to gender expression. Right. Other people say, well, you know, there are some data that suggests that you can see sex differences in gender expression even before kids seem to develop the awareness of the two boxes. And so let's say that's the case. Um, once they become aware of the two boxes, they might think, oh, well, I like to do A, B, and C. So that must mean I'm in this box. Um, so there, the direction of effect is in the other direction. One of the interesting therapeutic issues is, you know, to what extent is there any merit in exploring with a kid that, you know, somebody in box A can do all kinds of things. It doesn't mean you have to go into box B to do these things. <clears throat> and sometimes uh, we would see um, sort of a light bulb go off in some kids where, for example, with birth assigned females, if you gave them the label, you know, there are some girls who like to do boy things and they're called tomboys. And 
a kind of light bulb goes off and they think, oh, okay. So I can do A, B, and C. I don't have to be a boy to do A, B, and C. Um, so one has to think about, you know, how, how does one respond to the gender variant behavior or how does one respond to the child's frequent expression of wanting to be the other gender. What's interesting, if you think about those models, and if we accelerate up to the last, let's say 15 years, where a gender social transition long before puberty is a therapeutic approach. I call it a therapeutic approach to reduce gender dysphoria. Um, part of the meta theory is that all of the behaviors are coming from within the child <clears throat> and the parent is just following the lead of the child. Um, and so in that model, there's a lot of skepticism that socialization and how the social environment responds is in any way influential or causal, um, or maybe I should just say is in any way causal. One is just going along uh, with what is perceived to be coming entirely from within the child. Um, and what's interesting about it, we haven't really gotten into politics yet, but you know, that model is an essentialist one. It's a born that way model. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very rare for, let's say, progressive liberal parents to be essentialists in other ways or progressive liberal clinicians to be essentialists in other ways. Um, so it's one of the interesting political aspects yeah. of all of this. It's like conservatives. Conservatives are largely essentialists, except when it comes to gender and sexual orientation yeah that's it's like true. everything is flipped it must be difficult to reconcile an essentialist view of uh gender identity when you saw kids who had experienced trauma or you know some something in their environment um that caused their, their gender distress or their desire to be the the opposite sex well you know one reason that i'm not an essentialist as opposed to, you know, some kind of biopsychosocial type, is that, you know, over many years we were following the young children and we published one follow up study in 2008 on a small sample of birth assigned females. We finally got around to publishing our follow up study of birth assigned males in 2021 where like many of the other well almost all of the other follow-up studies in the literature you know we found a high rate of desistance 88 percent in our two studies and because you know i knew that this was what we were finding uh maybe that reinforced my perspective that when seeing young kids, it's too early to know how things are going to evolve. And as we talked about in our 2021 paper, if you look at the dozen or so follow-up studies in the literature, um, the kinds of treatment kids had in these studies, if they did have treatment, 
was varied. It could have been parents doing things in the day-to-day -day environment, like arranging play dates. It could have been parent counseling, could have been individual therapy for the kid um, of various types. There were the psychodynamic, psychoanalytic approaches, behavior therapy approaches, a whole wide range of therapeutic approaches, basically based on the philosophical and theoretical biases of the clinician that parents happen to see. Um, but in these older follow-up studies, virtually none of the kids had as a form of psychosocial treatment a gender social transition. Now, as I was saying earlier, an unknown percentage of prepubertal kids are socially transitioned. They, their parents might implement that even before seeing a clinician, a clinician might recommend it. Maybe the clinician and parent do it together, et cetera, et cetera. And I've written a few papers where, you know, I've said, I don't think that these older follow-up studies can necessarily be used to predict what's going to happen to uh in the long run, kids who socially transition, that I think the odds that the socially transition kids will persist into adolescence and beyond will be way, way higher. And certainly the short-term follow-up studies that uh, Christina Olson has done uh, also with you know a non-representative sample certainly suggests that there's going to be a high rate of persistence and you know one of my arguments is that it should be recognized that social transition is a type of treatment it's just a different type of treatment mm -hmm. and as long as people are informed that the type of treatment may impact the developmental course then you know parents can decide how they feel about it yeah it's uh if it ha if it has that much impact on outcomes it's a it sounds like a very powerful psychosocial intervention you know if it, if it means the difference between a kid desisting or persisting that's a, a significant crossroads yeah no i should say I'll just add one thing, you know, one of the critics, one of the criticisms of the older follow up studies, the quality of them varied, early studies didn't use you know, DSM criteria because DSM criteria didn't exist at the time. But for the studies that we did and the Dutch did, um, we did use the DSM criteria. And one criticism, which is a reasonable one, is that, well, not all of the kids in the follow-up studies um, met the complete criteria in childhood. So in our clinic, say we saw a six-year-old, we might have said they were sub-threshold for the diagnosis at the time of the assessment, although some of them may have met it in prior years. But people would say, well, the sub-threshold kids have nothing to desist from because they didn't have a diagnosis to begin with. Um, so we've analyzed the data as a function of whether kids met the complete criteria or not. And I don't have the exact percentage with me, but I think around 70% of the kids who met the complete criteria did desist. Um, and so they did have something to desist from. 
Um, you know, the, the whole argument of, you know, they didn't meet criteria, it, you know, I mean, logically it, it, on the surface, it sounds, it seems to make sense, but given that these kids that are showing up to clinics now, um, they don't necessarily meet the full criteria either in order to access uh, medical treatment. And a lot of um, clinics are even saying that you don't even need gender dysphoria at all to be trans and access these treatments. So it, it, it does, it's not a criticism of your study that really holds up if, if, they are, if they're suggesting that the criteria should have been tightened up for your study, but they don't seem to argue that the criteria should be tightened up for medical treatment at clinics these days. And what I would say, you know, based on, I think some of the adolescents we saw back in the day, they may not have met the complete criteria for gender identity disorder of childhood or gender dysphoria when they were kids. They may have had some indicators, um, but things then intensified and they were seen uh, in adolescence, when let's say a kid started to verbalize more consistently that they wanted to live as uh, another gender. But what you're bringing up is, I think, I think it's the most interesting development in the field with regard to children and adolescents. And that's what I believe is a whole new subgroup of adolescents who Lisa Littman has, you know, labeled rapid onset gender dysphoria, um, where the parents are pretty clear that their kid did not show any signs of gender dysphoria, much less even gender non-conforming behavior until mm -hmm. let's say middle school age seven or grade seven or eight or even later and um when the kid comes out and says to the parents uh i think i have gender dysphoria or i'm trans because there was no gender developmental history uh suggestive of such the parents are stunned and and surprised now you know one point i want to make is that um you know adolescent females you know don't have the male equivalent of transvestic fetishism it's a male phenomenon but we do see uh, late onset males with gender dysphoria, you know, who don't seem to have the co-occurring transvestic fetishism. And they may well also fall under this new rubric of rapid onset gender dysphoria. So among biological males, there may be like two subtypes okay. of late yeah. onset that's got to be sorted out as we go along. But, um, you know, and the this, you know, new rapid onset group um, is predominantly female, um, which is consistent with you know, this overall shift in the sex ratio that we've been seeing among adolescents for the last 15 plus years um, internationally. All clinics now are seeing, you know, birth assigned females at a ratio of at least two to one um, females to males. Whereas in the early days, it was inverted and um, that also you know, needs to be understood. You know, it gets into the, an interesting question is, 
what is the true prevalence of gender dysphoria? Mm -hmm. You know, is it one to one? Uh, is it not equal? And if it's not equal, you know, why? But it isn't like any of us know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in my own practice over the last five or so years, um, 70% of the adolescents I see are female, very consistent with what's being reported in clinics all over the place. Mm -hmm. Interesting what you said too, that in the early days that most of the kids you were seeing were internalizers. I would say that that's something that's flipped as well as we're seeing a lot of externalizers in the teenage cohort. Um, a lot of kids with ADHD um, and yes, yeah, so I, hadn't, I hadn't really pieced, put that together that that's also a, a change. Yeah. The, um, when I made that comment about internalizing, I was thinking more of children than adolescents, where I think it's more variable. Um, Maybe we could talk um, now a bit about what ended up happening to the clinic, and that, um, that's where some of the politics will, will enter into the conversation, I'm sure. Right. Um, well, um, it's been almost seven years since uh, the clinic itself was closed. And obviously, I've had a long time to think about how to understand uh, what happened. And I would say a big component in retrospect is that it was even more political than I thought it was at the time. So um, you know, over the years, uh, you know, some people would critique, especially the work we were doing with children. Um, because we were, you know, pretty open about uh, the idea that reducing their gender dysphoria so that a kid would grow up and feel more comfortable in their own skin was a reasonable therapeutic goal. Um, and again, like I was saying earlier, that I think the approach to dealing with very young kids versus adolescents um, was a reasonable one, all things considered. Um, now, a lot of the critics, including those from the Toronto area, um, who were particularly vocal, um, never actually would ask, you know, to talk to me or somebody else in the clinic or even visit it so we could talk about what kind of work we did. And, um, and they would say nasty things about me, you know, in the paper or on the internet. And I just didn't take it seriously because I thought so much of what they were saying was ill-informed and inaccurate. Because it doesn't sound they, like they were former patients of yours. They were, they were activists in the community, adults, like adult activists in the Toronto area who... Yeah, both activists and clinician okay. activists or critics. Um, but I think back in the day, my view was, you know, if you're going to trash talk me, why should I reach out to you? When Dr. Bradley retired a couple of years before, proverbial shit hit the fan 
Um, she was a very well-respected child psychiatrist in Toronto. She, for example, was the psychiatrist in chief of child psychiatry for over 10 years. I think when we got attacked locally right at the end of 2014, uh, which led to the external review, I think if she had still been in the clinic, things may well have taken a very different direction. And then there were also some changes in administrators um, who I think uh, were not particularly friendly to me and without having a well-respected child psychiatrist working with me as opposed to a junior psychiatrist, I think it made things more vulnerable. Having said that, um, during 2015, when we were being, we were gonna be externally reviewed, you know, I was of two minds, okay, uh, people are gonna make suggestions for change uh, that we could, I think, reasonably implement, or this is all optics and they basically wanna get rid of me in the clinic. But I wasn't sure which way it was gonna go. Um, but I think that as it evolved, you know, it became more apparent what was going on. So for example, our, I was promised along with the psychiatrist I was working with, we would get a chance to see the external review and comment on it before it was made available. That never happened. I was shown it only on the day I was terminated. And when, you know, I started to leaf through it, I saw various inaccuracies, but then when I got to the page where I allegedly said to an adult patient, who of course I never saw adults, that this person, birth assigned female, was a hairy little vermin. I said, you know, there's no real point uh, in me saying any more because um, you know, this is complete nonsense. And, you know, later that day, they were going to release the report to the entire world without changing anything. And so, uh, but that particular comment uh, which where Jesse Single, the journalist, was able to track down this person who acknowledged that I didn't say that. I never saw this person, but that was a big part of my successful lawsuit where not only did I get apologies, um, which were made public, but I also you know, received, you know, a large sum of money and all my legal expenses paid because I think the CAMH knew that going to court might wind up being very problematic. But, you know, in retrospect, as politics have intensified over the past seven years, I think the clinic was an early example of cancel culture. Mm -hmm. um, do I think the administrators uh, care about kids with gender dysphoria? 
I don't think so. But they did what they thought was politically correct at the time. Um, but do they have a genuine concern for these kids? I'm skeptical. I hadn't heard of any other clinic um, suffering the same fate. Were you aware of any um, activist attacks on other clinics like that? Um, well, I think uh, the critique of some people of the Tavistock Clinic was less about children as opposed to in the early days, the Tavistock's caution and reluctance to use hormonal blockers. Uh, so at the time, the Gender Identity Development Service was led by a child psychiatrist, Domenico DeCegli, and I think that, you know, he was. Uh, more cautious about it so the early criticism of that clinic was they were going too slow um but i i don't think any other child and adolescent clinic uh has been critiqued, you know, from the side that ours was. So basically, I mean, roughly, it's probably starting about 15 years ago, it sounds like the activists got their way. I mean, the activists lobbied um, very heavily to make changes to the system and how how this work is done. Um, closing down clinics like yours and, and implementing what they now call the affirmation model, which then morphed into a, an informed consent model. Um, so the Tavistock clinic closure, um, having gone through, it, is still going through a review process, but CAS review, um, basically the, it is being shut down for the, the complete opposite reason that, that your clinic was, was shut down, that um, there were, it's my understanding there were long wait lists for the program, but once people were seen, they were started on a medical pathway very quickly. Uh, so there really wasn't, to my knowledge, uh, much psychotherapeutic work being done with these young people. Um, and... Yeah, the, the micro details, I don't know enough about, but I would say something like this, you know, when, that clinic was designated as a specialty, specialty center in 2009. My understanding is it made it easier for anybody in the UK to come to that clinic. Well, one clinic can't handle an entire population of children and adolescents with gender dysphoria. And so, you know, over the years, they wound up, you know, having a couple of thousand kids on their waiting list. It would be like, you know, in the city of Toronto, there being only one clinic for kids with ADHD. You'd have a lineup going out to the airport. Mm -hmm. And so in a way... the success of the clinic became its worst enemy that they just became overwhelmed with referrals. Now, if you think about, let's just say we're talking about adolescence where the original model of pubertal suppression that the Dutch talked about was, you know, putting puberty on pause gives kids some more time to think about where they're heading without having to experiencing the distress of, you know, a masculinizing or a feminizing body 
as the case may be. But, you know, if you're now sitting on a waiting list, that's one to two years, and then you have to go through a whole assessment mm -hmm. and then be seen in endocrinology. It sort of defeats the whole purpose, the original purpose at least, of you know the idea of a pause to help reduce distress, which gives kids more time to think about things. Um, so that's kind of ironic. And I think that's now true for almost all of the clinics because everybody has these really long waiting lists. Mm -hmm. there, is um, a, there is a children's hospital in Ontario that's um, prescribing the puberty blockers before the first visit so they could start them while they're on the wait list. Right. So there's a group in London, Ontario. I've seen like this referral letter that they send to the family doctor saying you know there's a long waiting list but if you want to start your kid on you know this is what you should do but um what's pretty interesting about that to me is that here you have you know a group of clinicians who are recommending a treatment without ever even seeing the kid mm -hmm. Is that common in medicine to recommend treatments without actually seeing the patient? Especially as we're learning more and more about the the risks of of puberty blockers, that they're they're not a they're not a risk free intervention as they're often promoted. But you know, and it's it's you know interesting that you know they they take that position of um, recommending hormonal suppression as opposed to what some people might call watchful waiting or exploring more that's going on. And it also sort of assumes a complete homogeneity of the clinical population. So, you know, remember in the original Dutch model in terms of eligibility criteria for hormonal suppression, the Dutch argued that there should be a long-standing history of gender dysphoria. And by that, you know, they mean mm -hmm. childhood onset. But nowadays, you know, we're seeing so many kids where the onset is brief you know, sometimes I'll get, you know, a call from a parent where they just heard about this a week ago or three months ago with no earlier history. So do we ignore that in thinking about a therapeutic plan or does one, you know, take a one size fits all approach and say they all should be on hormonal suppression and i think yeah. you know that that is i think arguable and you know although there's very little systematic data you know certainly not all adolescents with gender dysphoria persist some do desist and we need to figure out, you know, what are the best predictors of persistence and desistence? You know, why would we want to recommend a treatment that is partially irreversible or completely irreversible if in the long run that turns out not to be the treatment that you know, people who are regretting it or mm -hmm. detransition uh, talk about, you know, right now there's so much that we don't know, you know, who are the detransitioners? How do they differ from the ones who persist and continue and are well adjusted? Um, so th there's a lot of unknowns mm -hmm. given that that's the case. I just find it weird that, a group 
would recommend a treatment without even seeing the patient. Yeah. I don't want to keep you much longer. Um, I just have one final question for you. Uh, I, I know one of the accusations that I've seen um, directed at you is of conversion therapy, and that's been on, on a lot of therapists' minds lately, especially um, in countries that have passed federal um, or local conversion therapy laws. And I just wanted to give you an opportunity to explain why the, the psychotherapeutic work that you were doing isn't conversion therapy and is, is different from conversion therapy. Well, you know, the term conversion therapy, it's a political term in many ways, um, but it was originally introduced, you know, as a label to critics of clinicians uh, who were often, let's say, politically conservative or there was a religious component to it who were working with adult, mainly uh, androphilic adult men who didn't want to be gay. And so back in the early 90s, uh, this one psychologist you know, coined the term reparative therapy or used the term reparative therapy this was largely being used as a term for people who would go for treatment because they didn't want to be gay or, or homosexual, or sometimes they were pressured to seek out that treatment. And, you know, one of the you know, criticisms over the years has been that you know, more mainstream psychologists and psychiatrists who back in, let's say, the 60s and 70s would see adult gay men mainly, and they would use the treatments that they use for other things to see if the person's sexual orientation could change. Um but a lot of people moved away from it because the data suggested that people's sexual orientation does not change. And therefore, uh, why are we doing this? And of course, you know, I think political critique nudged people along and there were evolving views about gay people, obviously. I mean, one of the ironies now is that a lot of people who work in the field of health disparities between uh, or among gays and bisexuals and heterosexuals is some people nowadays talk about how, well, maybe sexual orientation is more mutable than we used to think, but if people do change, it's coming from them, not because it's imposed by them. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened, I think, is that starting with the state of California that passed legislation about so-called conversion therapy, activists were very successful in adding the gender identity tail onto the um, onto the dog that initially was about sexual orientation. And um, it's as if an original piece of legislation being directed about towards, let's say, adolescents or adults when it comes to sexual orientation is now, in a sense, working its way down to children as young as three where sexual orientation isn't even an issue um and so i think and, and the other thing i would point out is that i don't think any mainstream psychologist psychiatrist social worker nowadays practices conversion therapy 
along the lines of you know that label um i don't know anybody who does and so i just reject the term outright what i would say is you know the therapeutic approach that i think i use is a developmental one where the goal is to reduce gender dysphoria one way or the other um and there may be more than just two ways um but the goal is to explore things to figure out what is the best therapeutic pathway to take and what i would note about the legislation in all of these states and jurisdictions in canada is there's always uh, this does not apply clause. So it says, you know, it's okay to explore a child's gender or gender identity, that that's not considered, quote, conversion therapy. The problem, of course, is the legislation doesn't define what exploring identity means. Um, I think that, you know, I haven't, you know, read the new edition of the standards of care uh, that just came out in the last week or so, but I did see one paragraph where they say, as long as you're not assuming that one outcome is better than another, exploring gender identity with a child or adolescent patient is not conversion therapy but you know the term conversion therapy has such a negative valence mm -hmm. it's hard to know you know if people are aware of the nuance in the legislation and, you know maybe some clinicians say you know, i just don't want to work with these people because you know i don't want my life to be ruined by somebody alleging that i'm practicing conversion therapy yeah i think yeah i've heard a lot of clinicians express that concern well thank you so much for taking the time out of your uh your evening to speak with me it's been a pleasure nice talking with you take care Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Transparency Podcast. If you enjoy our content, please help out our algorithm by hitting like or subscribe. If you'd like to make a donation, follow the link to our PayPal account. On behalf of the Gender Dysphoria Alliance, thanks for your support.